Unlike our second reading from Hebrews today, which was written to Jews, the reading from the gospel, from Mark, was written to Gentiles. And it was believed to be the very first gospel written. Well, the fact that it was written to Gentiles means that it was written to us. We are Gentiles. See, the the term Gentile in the Bible meant those who were non-Jewish, no matter where they came from. So, we qualify. Now, why would that be important? Well, perhaps all throughout the gospel, the disciples who were followers of Jesus, the ones closest to him, didn't get it. Just like sometimes we don't get it. They didn't seem to understand what Jesus was trying to teach them about the kingdom of God. And so this gospel shows those very disciples not as religious or spiritual superstars, but as people just like us. They struggled, we struggle. We struggle to understand Jesus' message and more importantly, how to live it out. Now, in today's reading, John and James were really having a problem with how to live it out because even though they were his closest disciples, remember they were with Peter, Peter, James, and John for the transfiguration. They were first among the called, Simon and Peter first, and then James and John. You know, they, they were there from the beginning. And yet, the fact that they didn't get it makes us, should make us feel a little better about ourselves. And you know what they didn't get? That the kingdom of God is about serving, not being served. I, I just can imagine when they came to Jesus and said, oh, Master Rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said, okay, what? You know, are y'all kids? <laughs> that sounds like what kids would say to their parents. And then they say, well, Why don't you let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory? Yeah, we want to sit there with your power, with a capital P, so we can have it too. Yay, yay, yay. (laughs) Jesus, he must have just shaken his head. How could they not have gotten all that they had been taught already? They didn't get the message about serving And so what he did, he called the 12 together and told them that whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Now, the other 10 disciples, apparently they didn't get it either because they were mad about James and John. Uh, I guess they probably thought, why didn't we ask that first? Or some of them might might already have gotten it and and thought, how can James and John be so dumb? Do you remember that James and John were the sons of Zebedee? Well, Jesus had another name for them. He called them the sons of thunder. And we can imagine why. Either they were very loud or they made a lot of commotion wherever they went with whatever they did. And maybe that's why they didn't remember all that Jesus was telling them. It's not like it had been the first time that he told them that. Mm -mm. He told them over and over what was gonna happen to him. He had just told them that when, when they were on the road to Jerusalem that he was going to be handed over to the authorities, the religious authorities, when he got to Jerusalem. This he had told them in the, well, the three verses of scripture right before what we read, so we didn't hear that this morning. But he told them that he was gonna be handed over to the religious authorities, and he'd be condemned to death. And then he'd be handed over to the Gentiles, 
who would mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And that after three days, he would rise. But James and John didn't get it. They must have only latched on to that part about him rising again, you know, him being in his glory and having power and filter it out all the suffering. And you know what? That wasn't even the first time that they'd heard that. They were on another road passing through Galilee when Jesus was teaching them again and said that the Son of Man would be betrayed into human hands and be killed and after three days he'd rise. Well, when the disciples heard that, it said that they did not understand and they were afraid to ask him. That was one time, two times, a third time, a previous time, they were on their way to Caesarea Philippi on the road. They were on the road a lot. And it says that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. This was the time, you'll remember, when Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And Jesus responded with, get behind me, Satan. You're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And that is also what James and John were doing Even though they'd heard it three times, what was going to happen to Jesus, and more than three times about serving and not being served, and yet they boldly asked to sit at his right hand and left hand. What they had in their minds was how it was in their world before they met Jesus. In fact, how it was still in their world. The pattern of behavior that they knew from the secular and religious authorities of their time. The very authorities that lorded it over them and were even tyrants over them. That's what they were thinking about, human things. I love Jesus' reaction. He didn't send John and James away. He didn't tell them that they just weren't getting it and if it had taken them this long, then he didn't need them around. Uh Uh-uh, he didn't do that. He didn't even tell them that they were stupid or bad or worse. He knew by their question that they didn't get it yet. And so he said to them, you don't, know what you're asking. That response stated what was obvious to him, but not to them, or even to the ten who had been angry with James and John. So, Jesus began teaching them again. Teaching them that the pattern of behavior in the kingdom of God is different. Different. Whoever wishes to become great among you, he says to them, must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Okay, why Why did it take the disciples of Jesus so long Why did they have to hear it so many times before they actually got what he was saying? And for that matter, how do we Gentiles, why does it take us so long? Why don't we get it immediately? All right, I'm gonna go back to before I was ordained and tell you something about what I did then. I was in the advertising industry. My major in college, at the University of Georgia. (laughs) Go dogs. Well, it was in advertising and public relations. And one of the things that I remember um, from working in that industry was how many exposures it would take before 
uh, someone actually would um, remember or recognize something that was totally new to them? Seven. Seven was the number of times for that exposure to happen before someone might just be aware of some new product or, you know, new, new feature of a product. For a new idea, like Jesus was presenting to them, a new way of thinking, a new way of being, a new way of seeing the world, seeing yourself in relationship with God. You'd need a lot more than seven exposures. You'd need it over and over and over. And not just hearing something or studying something. In order to really get it, you had to try to live in the new way. That new way of being that requires us to maybe do things we quite don't understand why we're doing them, but we do them anyway. Because as we do them, we start to understand. And like the disciples, we might even ask the wrong questions. Until more and more, as we live it, the right questions come. You know, we, we come to church week after week, year after year, and we hear the word of God. We hear Jesus telling us about serving and being served. So we get many exposures. Yet still, sometimes we get it wrong. Maybe sometimes more than right. But we keep trying. And it's not just in our individual lives. It's in our corporate lives. But then other times we get it right. And when we get it right, Something happens, we get changed, and so we keep trying. And never, ever, ever does God push us away because we don't get it right or don't know the right questions to ask. Instead, like the disciples, Jesus continues to invite us to keep learning, to keep growing, to keep going deeper into the mystery of God's love. You know, each week during our Eucharistic prayer, we use the word remembrance. We are to remember what it is that Jesus has told us and how we are to live. But this word remembrance, it's used, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood of the new covenant. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And that word, remembrance, is from the Greek. Anamnesis. Anamnesis is the word that we translate as remembrance. But it means much more than just remembering. It means bringing into the present that which was in the past and making it real now in the present. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. We speak of the bread and wine that we receive as being the real presence of Christ that we take into our bodies. We take into our bodies because we now are the body of Christ in this world. And our world is not so different from that of James and John. And we do know, by the way, that they eventually did get it and live it out, spreading the good news, the gospel to the world. And we're, we're called to do the same thing. I think the problem is, how do we know how to do it? So earlier this week, um, I was at my dentist office. I'm gonna make this work here, okay. <laughs> and, and the dental assistant cleaning my teeth, uh, she happened to be an Episcopalian as well, so we talked about our churches. When I told her I was working on the sermon for this Sunday, she said, well, 
she always liked it when the sermon actually gave her suggestions for things to do. Things that would help her in the coming week to live out her faith and her desire to serve. Oh, she actually said that. Yeah. Her desire to live out her faith and to to serve. Gentiles that we are, how do we live out being servants, slaves of all? So here's my suggestion for the coming week. Uh, First of all, by prayer. St. Paul reminds us when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, through prayer. Offering our prayers to Christ and asking, what, what do I need to do this? Rather than, why don't you let me sit at your right hand or left? It's different, isn't it? Prayer is so essential, it's where to start and it's also to end. Now, if you happen to watch the video this past week that highlighted the Daughters of the King, you might have heard, perhaps for the first time, the motto of the Daughters, because I think it helps us know where to go and how to do what it is God's calling us to do in serving. That motto says, for his sake, I am but one, but I am one. I cannot do everything but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. What I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. Lord, what will you have me do? Simple. Lord, what will you have me do? Becoming a servant, a slave of all in the kingdom of God, It becomes possible when we seek God's grace, when we ask, Lord, what will you have me do? Perhaps we have to do that over and over. I bet we do. I do. The disciples did. So let us pray. Oh Lord, mercifully receive our prayers and grant that we may know and understand what things we ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.